Hawaii is just so special for so many reasons. I think if Darwin had just bypassed the Galapagos, he would have dedicated so much time to the evolution of his theories, literally, if he had spent some time, if the beagle had managed to find its way to the Hawaiian Islands. And it's just, it's, it really is the laboratory of evolution. It also is a place which is really the front lines, the battlefield of conservation. So many incredible species of life live here. Many of the species that live here are in great jeopardy. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I feel, you know, I, and I have been to Maui before. I filmed in Maui and I had, did a, gave a speech here about seven or eight years ago in Maui at the Kapalua place and had a great time. So it's wonderful to be here, especially since it's like 10 degrees at home. So, <laughs> so a lot of people, and I'm, I'm just going to sort of walk you through a little bit what I do, why I do it, and we're going to focus in on conservation. Um, I'm not a speech writer, I just go by what's on my brain, and we're going to hopefully pull in Hawaii and then um, eventually open it up for you guys, and we can all uh, have a, a conversation together about this. But a lot of, you know, I'm now, you know, shockingly, I can't believe it, but uh, a lot of people think I'd live to be it, but I'm 42 years old, or about to be 42. I, sa I keep saying I'm 42, so it's easier, so when it comes. And, um, but... I have always had a great fascination for the natural world, ever since I was a little child. And when I was about six years old, I was in my grandfather's backyard, and I was sifting and rolling through uh, a big pile of, 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 of wood that had been, a cord of wood that had been stacked. And I saw this thing, this incredible thing that I had never seen before. Hopefully you'll never see one in Hawaii. It was legless, it was scaly, it was about this long, it had a flickering tongue, and my heart started to beat. And if you watch the stuff I do on TV, you know I'm very fascinated and intrigued by these creatures. And again, I was this little city kid. We lived in a, in a four family or a three family, and my dad was a Boston police officer. My mom was a nurse, and we lived in a city called Quincy outside of Boston. Um, not the most perfect place for a nature lover like myself. So I took great refuge in visiting my grandparents' property. And there was this creature. And just as I saw it, it just disappeared. It was just sort of like an untwisted turban. It just went into the wood. It sort of melted away. And I panicked. I thought I had discovered this thing. And the moment of discovery, I had lost it. So I just started to tear through the wood. And finally, I got down to that low layer. You know, maybe you've seen this in Hawaii when you've turned over an old stump or an old piece of dry coral or something, and you get that to that detritus layer where there's maybe rotten leaves and some wisps of forgotten spider web. And they were all there, and there was this perfectly coiled thing. And I didn't even know what that thing was. We didn't have. TV shows like mine back then. So I just sort of instinctively reached out and grabbed onto it. And it instinctively reached back and grabbed onto me. And I sort of went into my grandmother's home. My grandmother was sitting there, and my dad was there, and my grandfather was there, and my mom was there. And I think at that time they were all drinking frescas. I don't think they make fresca anymore. But so. I, I, looked at, I, I looked at them, and there was this thing hanging there, and I looked at my grandmother, and my grandmother looked at me, she went, get rid of it! And I went, no! And my dad just kind of went, uh-oh, you're on your own. Because my grandmother, she was not to be trifled with, you know, rest her soul, right up till her passing. I remember in her presence, I would sort of develop cankasores like stigmata in preparation of the soap and the alkaloid reaction that she was going to be feeding me and for something I said. So there was this thing hanging from my arm and I said, no, I won't get rid of it. And she said, why not? And I went, because I love it. <laughs> so we had this sort of born free moment where they pried the snake off my arm. It was a garter snake. 
we took it back into the wood pile and we released it into the wood pile and it just sort of nervously went, I'm out of here and disappeared. And that was the day when I became a naturalist. Formerly, I'm a wildlife biologist. I got the, went to the college and pedigree stuff that most biologists and scientists have. But for me, that was the day that I became a naturalist, someone who's fascinated by the natural world and wants to explore it, make discoveries, and share those discoveries. And that creature was my invitation into wild places and into wild things. And I often think if I had rolled over that log and instead of seeing a snake, there was a, uh, a guitar, maybe I'd have been a rock star or something. And, <laughs> Or if I had turned over that log and I saw a, um, like a golf club, maybe I'd have been a Tiger Woods or a serial killer or something like that. But, <laughs> but I was hardwired from that moment on to be a naturalist, and snakes were sort of my, my drug of choice as a naturalist. And I was just so fascinated by them. And that snake taught me so much. If anyone knows, and I say, hopefully you'll never see one here, because while I love snakes very much, they don't belong in Hawaii, and there's the, 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 the conservation community is just sort of at the very edge of their seats, just praying not for that dreadful call that the, the brown snake has shown up somewhere here, um, because it would devastate, devastate the ecology here. It's not the snake's fault at all, it's just surviving. It's our fault for not being careful.